Texas Fortress on a Hill with Henry, Danny, Kagan, and Giovanni. Welcome everyone to Fortress on a Hill, a podcast about U.S. foreign policy, anti-imperialism, skepticism, and the American way of war. I'm Henry. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We are here today to talk with journalist and political analyst KJ No. KJ, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing great, and I'm delighted to be with you. Thank you. Thank you again for for joining us. So KJ No is a journalist, political analyst, writer, and educator specializing in the geopolitics of the Asia-Pacific region. He writes for Dissident Voice, Black Agenda Report, Counterpunch, Popular Resistance, Asia Times, uh, MR Online, and MR Online. He also does frequent commentary and analysis on the news programs, The Critical Hour, By Any Means Necessary, Fault Lines, Political Misfits, Loud and Clear, Breakthrough News, and KPFA Flashpoints. He's reported extensively on great power competition, geostrategic messaging, and propaganda, media structure and ecology, and its effects on communities. He's also collaborated with various scholars on the geopolitics of global health, Indigenous health rights policy, structural violence, and medical care delivery under neoliberal capitalism. He uh, recently pioneered a groundbreaking study with uh, Dr. Claudia Chauffan on the military transmission of infectious diseases and their implications for COVID transmission. He believes a functioning and healthy society requires good information. To that end, he strives to combat Weaponization and disinformation of uh, weaponization of disinformation in the current Cold War climate. He's also a member of Veterans for Peace and a founding founding member of Pivot to Peace. I was wondering, if you give, please give us a little bit of background on on you, um, where you're from, how you came to study these topics, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so uh, I'm KJ. Uh, I'm a South Korean. I grew up. Uh, in South Korea, and I lived through three military dictatorships, and I also served uh, in the military and combat infantry uh, during the Chanduan dictatorship. And so I think that gives you a pretty large burden of uh, wanting to figure out uh, essentially what's wrong and how to fix it. And so I've been a political activist, you know, since my early, early teens, really. Uh, and uh, I have focused specifically on uh, geopolitics uh, as a journalist, but in particular, the U.S. pivot to Asia uh, starting 2012. So I've probably done some of the most intensive coverage uh, of that escalation of, of any journalist that I know. Uh, and so uh, what, I'm, what I'm noticing right now, and it's no consolation is that the things that I and a few other people have been saying or really shouting for for close to a decade, all of this stuff is coming to pass. And we're seeing ourselves inching closer and closer to the precipice of kinetic war in Asia. And as we know, we're already in kinetic war uh, with Russia through, through a proxy war. Uh, and so, you know, I feel that it's really, really important for us to get the word out to get the truth out, for people to understand what's happening, and really to cut through this fog of propaganda, disinformation, misinformation. Because we know that, you know, when we go to war, uh, truth is the first casualty. But even before that, uh, it's the information war that sets the ground for the kinetic war. It's the information war is the pre-kinetic dimension of, uh, of kinetic war. So, um, so bring us in kind of to where the, where you see, uh, South Korea is at right now in terms of its relationship to the U S and, and in terms of the, you know, the new cold war, um, that, you know, that the, you know, uh, South Korea has been a U.S. ally for a long, long time that includes um, troops, you know, got, uh, how many thousands fought with American troops in, in Vietnam. There's probably other operations that I can't, I can't, uh, think of at the moment. Um, 
but our relationship is 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 very much a, a war making one that with the with the games with the what is it twenty eight thousand American troops that are in South Korea yes. with status of the DMZ that it 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 is one that is first and foremost about war footing absolutely yes well the U S military and the South Korean Korean military are deeply, deeply enmeshed. Uh, uh, the South Korean military functions without exaggeration as an arm of the U.S. military. And what I mean by that is the United States still has OPCON, operational control, over the South Korean military, all of its facilities, all of its arms, all of its bases, the moment that it decides that it wants this. South Korea gave OPCON over to the to United States in uh, July of 1950, and it's never gotten OPCON back from the United States. In, uh, in the 90s, the U.S. decided that it was only going to have wartime OPCON rather than full OPCON. But, you know, this is like saying that you own the car when it's on the road and the South Koreans can have it when it's in the garage. It doesn't yeah. mean anything. And the U.S. can declare or actually claim OPCON anytime they decide that they declare DEFCON 3, then they get to have operational control over South Korea's 600,000 active duty and probably close to another 3 million reserve duties. So that is an extraordinary firepower. It's actually the largest mil military manpower on the planet. And the U.S. essentially gets that for free. The South Koreans pay the United States to have them stationed uh, on their uh, territory. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we see there is this constant military war gaming against North Korea. I mean, these have been literally constant, at least since the 1970s, Team Spirit. And then they were, you know, they keep changing the names. And now we have uh, twice a year, Ulti Freedom Guardian and uh, Tok Suri you know, these are large war games. The last time before COVID, uh, the larger war game involved about 300,000 troops uh, conducted for weeks. So these are the, probably the largest, most threatening military war games on the planet. Uh, they're done twice a year. They're momentarily suspended during COVID and during the Trump era when there was a little bit of rapprochement with North Korea. But now the U.S. is doing them right again, doing them in full intensity. And uh, they just finished the fall war games, which are always timed to coincide with North Korea's harvest season. So in, North Korea is a very poor country. It's agriculturally hard to sustain itself. Only 15% of the land is arable. And that means all hands on deck when we do harvesting and planting. The U.S. always times its war games to coincide with the planting season and the harvesting season. Uh, and so, you know, North Korea has to divert manpower away and soldiers do a lot of, you know, the agricultural work as well. So they have to drop everything, man the barracks, uh, and then, you know, North Korea struggles and then they get uh, dragged through the coals for, uh, for being food insecure, right? For starving their own people. So there's such a kind of, uh, you know, hypocritical and ugly dynamic that's going on. But U.S. conducts war games uh, uh, at least twice annually, although since August, they've done nonstop war games. They've done four sets of war games, either with Korea and South, with South Korea or with Japan in the Philippines and just in the Pacific. They've just been ongoing and nonstop. And the North Koreans have been very, very upset about this. They fired a few missiles. But the key thing to understand, and I don't think I can emphasize this uh, enough is that uh, I, I'm assuming that among our audience, we have some Vietnam era veterans Many. and uh, uh, those of us who, you know, understand a little bit about the war, we understand that it, you know, the carpet bombing, the napalming, the free fire zones, Operation Phoenix, uh, all of these things that we saw in Vietnam. All of those things were prefigured and uh, and tested in South Korea before they were done in Vietnam. So I'm really talking about you know the genocidal levels of carpet bombing. Uh, conservative estimates 
uh, estimate that one out of five North Koreans were killed in the war. Uh, if you look at the footage, read the footage at the time, you know, the entire country was turned into a moonscape. There are journalists who traveled through North Korea at the time, they said, uh, traveling across North Korea was like traveling on the surface of the moon. There was nothing left standing. You know, anything higher than one story was pulverized. By January of 1951, the U.S. pilots were complaining that there was nothing left to bomb. And still, they continued bombing for another uh, two years. And so, you know, we're really talking about this kind of genocidal level of biblical, uh, you know, destruction. And when you have a country like that, that has gone through that, uh, and still they manage to claw themselves out and build a, a functioning society without going insane, which, or, or simply collapsing, which is usually what happens when countries are exposed to that level of violence. Uh, and then, uh, and then like every, uh, at least twice a year, they're subjected to, uh, these war exercises that are designed to trigger North Korea's collective PTSD, you know, that, that is being done, uh, over and over and over again. And their demand since 1953 is, come on, let's cut this out. You know, can we have a peace? treaty? Can we stop this belligerence? Or at the very least, you know, can we get some kind of uh, restraining order against this? Because they cannot tolerate that. And their response, uh, you know, their demands have fallen on, uh, you know, deaf ears. And so their response has been to uh, prevent themselves from being destroyed, which is to build uh, their own nuclear weapons. By the way, North Korea was threatened with nuclear destruction during the Korean War. Uh, starting 1958, there are nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula until 1991. And then after 1991, they were removed. The tactical nukes were removed. And instead, the strategic nukes that were focused at the Soviet Union were pointed at North Korea. And so, you know, the North Korean approach has been, you know, if we can't get peace and we've tried and we've can't get normalized relations, we are going to at least try and create deterrence uh, and create a sense of security through that. But it's extraordinarily uh, escalatory and extraordinarily dangerous. And just recently, uh, Wendy Sherman and uh, you know the Biden administration, they've come out and threatened uh, North Korea with obliteration. Again, threatened them with complete obliteration you know, if they, uh, if they, you know, so much dare as to, you know, uh, launch any, do anything really. And, and for the American people that much, much in the same way that, um, you know, uh, history with the war in current war in Ukraine did not begin this year and it did not begin in 2014, but that's one big thing that we do is we decide when history ends and begins. And, you know, Korea being uh, known and I think correctly labeled, you know, as, as uh, the forgotten war, that the, the damage that it caused that the, the uh, and what the people still have to live through. And it, it is, it's, it's, a, it's a remarkable feat of spirit on the, on the side of the North Korean people to be able to do that. And I, you know, I, I will continue to see, to see that in different ways as far as U.S. hegemony and areas recovering, you know, places, Iraq, Afghanistan, Vietnam, um, you know, uh, and we talked a little bit before we started about your, your study about, about COVID transmission among the military. And I would wonder about, does South Korea ever do any, um, large scale testing of the, like the soil and water content or uh, not water contamination, but like samples that are near U.S. military bases in terms of to see how much of, you know, the firefighting foam and what whatever other PFAS contamination is actually getting there. I would assume that it's very similar to what we have here, that if it's on the base or it's immediately adjacent to the base where you're, the pollution is, is all right there uh, and it affects everybody, even people that aren't affiliated with the military at all. 
You're absolutely correct. You know, anytime you have a military base, a U.S. military outpost, with a certain footprint, you're going to get significant amounts of pollution. That's simply the nature of the military beast and the toxic materials that it uses and stores and carries. So just most recently, um, in the middle of uh, Seoul, the capital city, the U.S. had a huge garrison called Yongsan, where the 8th Army was stationed. And it's uh, a little bit smaller than Central Park, but if you can imagine a major metropolis like Seoul or New York, and if you can imagine that Central Park was uh, a military base, uh, that gives you a sense of what that is. Well, recently, the U.S. moved uh, the 8th Army uh, out of Yongsan, and they moved them down to Pyeongtaek, uh, which is the idea was to move them out of the range of North Korean artillery, you know. Uh, and the South Koreans spent, if I'm not mistaken, close to 10 billion building the U.S., the world's largest overseas base for uh, the U.S. troops in Pyeongtaek, Camp Pacey. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, just, just so that we know that, you know, uh, our troops are being well taken care of. Camp Casey, Pyeongtaek has two golf courses, not one, but two golf courses. Two golf courses. But, uh, but the Yongsan Army Base, uh, which is in the, in the process of, you know, kind of decontamination, is, it's full of toxics. So originally the idea that they were going to turn this into a, a, a public park, uh, but after, you know, testing the soil and after testing uh, you know, the water, they said, oops, you know, there's, there's too much uh, contamination uh, and it's dangerous to be there for longer than a few hours. So I think the Korean government is working on remediation, uh, but, uh, but, you know, who knows how long it will take and if it can be done properly. So once again, to come back to the Central Park uh, analogy, if you can imagine that, you know, uh, there were troops in Central Park and they left but Central Park was left, you know, tainted with dioxins and all kinds of poisons. Uh, they were also doing uh, bio-warfare research in South Korea. There was a program called Jupiter, uh, and uh, it's supposed, supposedly for bio-warfare detection, but, you know, they were sending live anthrax uh, through regular mail or a FedEx, and, you know, so... Just the level of danger and risk, once again, is extraordinary. But, you know, if we want to talk about cleaning things up, you know, first, I don't think, uh, I think it's a bad idea to have bases anywhere in general. But if a base leaves, you know, I think there should be a, a real cleanup. And, uh, and if a country leaves, uh, uh, you know, uh, a place where there's been war, you know, for God's sake, you know, clean up the mines. You know, Laos is, uh, you know, is still. Uh, I mean, you can make a direct correlation between uh, the mines in Laos uh, and the poverty in Laos, where there are large, uh, where there are still, you know, millions of mines laid. Those are the poorest areas of the country, and also the places where children don't go to school because their parents have been blown up or maimed and the children are working in the field. So I think there's so much uh, reparation and cleanup and, uh, you know, uh, uh, so much work to be done. Okay, Jeff, a uh, couple of things caught my attention. So I, so I was stationed there. I was stationed there in, in Humphrey and I was there doing that transition when they were actually, uh, uh, you know, they actually had a plans and actually in construction. They were acquiring more land around. It was more land around it. There was a, also there were protests uh, around that time, but uh, that was around the time I was leaving when the, the big protests happened uh, where people were being displaced from the area uh, to expand that base in, in Camp Humphrey. And that was the Korean government that paid for it, correct? The Korean government paid for that. And it also pays, if I'm not mistaken, I'll have to check my figures, it pays the U.S. military another billion dollars a year just for the privilege of being occupied 
by U.S. troops. Oh, there's a there's a book. But I don't know if you uh, if you've seen it by Michael Hudson, uh, economist. He talked. It's a book called Super Imperialism, mm-hmm. where he talks about that. He talks about that that the host countries are usually the ones that are are putting the bill for hosting a military feat. A U.S. military installation in their own in their own uh, country, and if you think about it, there's a roughly uh, there's not really a, a a concrete number, roughly from from 800 to 1,000 military bases around the around the world in about 130 countries around the world, right? And if each of those countries are footing the bill, you can imagine, and a lot of those countries are in poor countries. You can imagine, you know, what kind of industry this is, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And then the other piece I'll add to that is the Pentagon has never passed an audit in its life, right? Uh, The Pentagon budget has never, never, ever been fully audited. They've never passed, uh, uh, you know, an audit. And so here we have uh, large amounts of money uh, circulating, large amounts of money going to the military industrial complex, large amounts of money being paid by, quote unquote, the host countries that are essentially paying a protection racket and then uh, and then you know getting polluted and getting their land stripped away uh and you know i think it's 170 countries if you talk about countries that have lily pads or operations in them so it's a huge footprint it literally is an empire right it is uh a, it's an empire of bases and inside that, as you mentioned earlier with Camp Humphreys in Pyeongtaek, when they were expanding the base, um, that is traditionally farming land. And South Korea is not a big country. It needs every inch of farming land that it needs. Those were rice paddies. And they were farmers who were making their livelihood, you know, through farming, through growing rice. And the uh, Korean government, under the prompting of the U.S. military, decided that he was going to expand a base, create the largest base uh, on the planet. At currently, I think it's two, three thousand acres. I mean, it's it's enormous. Uh, and so all of these farmers were being displaced, and they fought tooth and nail to retain their land, to retain their livelihood, to retain their dignity. And of course, they were beaten back and you know throttled and taken out. Uh, same thing with the Thad, uh, with the Thad uh, installation. Uh, same thing, you know, massive protests against that. Uh, it still happens. Uh, they're still protesting the Thad uh, military base. But, you know, uh, once again, they don't have uh, their own sovereignty. In fact, the previous president, Moon Jae-in, said that he was opposed to having Thad on South Korean soil. Uh, and at that point, they were just plans. And after he became president, the South Korean military brought the THAAD missiles onto South, Korean sto- onto South Korean soil, installed them anyway, and they did not notify the president, who is the, the head of the army, right? They did not notify, the South Korean military did not notify the president of South Korea that they had brought in strategic weapons. And they were asked why. And they said, well, you know, we discussed this with the U.S. military and we had a non-disclosure agreement with, an, uh, with the U.S. military. And therefore, we did, not, we did not feel it was necessary to tell our commander in chief. I think that gives you a sense of you know, how the system works in South Korea. I remember I was, um, I was, um, I think I was there when the presidency, when, uh, uh, Rowan Moulin was elected around that time, I think it was in 2004, yes. I believe it was, uh, and I remember he was running on a platform of reducing the, uh, the American military presence in, in South Korea. It was very popular among uh, young people and of, uh, you know, continue with the sunshine policy, I believe it's called. Yes. Uh, to uh, reach out to North Korea and pretty much, because the ultimate goal, my understanding is, you know, reunification. Yes. Uh, I remember I had a, I had a, I was, I was with a, a South Korean soldier with, which we took with um, the call of Katusa, the, 
uh, Korea Army Team for U.S. Army. We were doing a uh, duty together. Mm-hmm. And I was just in conversation with him. He was telling me that his dream is that he was a, he was a biker. He was telling me that his dream was that that one day he'll be able to ride his motorcycle from one end of South Korea to the uh, to the to the other end of Korea. So the whole peninsula. That was his dream, you know. Uh, pretty much letting me know that he can't do that now because of the political divisions uh, that there exist there. Um, so can you? Uh, because I remember that that during his presidency, he was resisted a lot too by by parliaments. Uh, I remember there was a, a in parliament there was like this kind of uh, fist fights among congressmen. So or, or mm-hmm. whatnot. So during during his term, he had to be evacuated and and barricaded in his office and everything. And since mm-hmm. that, he kind of changed his tool his tune. I mean, he stopped talking about um, um, reducing the American presence in South Korea and. And he just pretty much just went along. And I believe he uh, he completed his term and committed suicide shortly after. Uh, can you yeah. tell us a little bit about, about him? Yeah, no, this is a really important part of Korean history. It's also a very sad one. Uh, no Mi Hyun was, um, he was kind of an extraordinary human being. Every, uh, every you know, few uh, decades, you know, there's uh, kind of an extraordinary politician who comes along and no Mu Hyun was a human rights lawyer <clears throat> under the military dictatorship of uh, Park Jong Yi and uh, Chun Doo Hwan, uh, and that's saying a lot because there were no human rights. So to be a human rights lawyer and to be a labor rights lawyer is is pretty extraordinary thing. He grew up in a dirt poor family. <clears throat> he was, I think, if I'm if I'm not mistaken construction lawyer. I don't think he graduated high school, but he, you know, built a little hut for himself and studied for the bar exam for seven years, eventually passed it, uh, and then became a lawyer. And he took on some of the most difficult cases uh, in uh, in South Korean uh, human rights history. Uh, and then eventually he was brought under the wing of Kim Dae-jung, who was really the first progressive South Korean president. Uh, and he succeeded Kim Dae-jung as president. And he was opposed to the U.S. military presence. He was opposed to the U.S. Uh, South Korea's client status uh, as a U.S. para-colony or neo-colony. And he came out of the student activist movement of the 1980s, which uh, there was a, a lot of discussion about uh, people trying to decide how do we get rid of this dictatorship? And there were two lines of thought. One is that we struggle for democracy uh, as best as we can inside our own country. And that there was another line of thought that's, that said, the reason why we don't have democracy is because all of these dictators have been put into place by the United States, which is absolutely true. And therefore our struggle for human rights has to become an anti-imperial struggle. And so uh, No Muyan came out of that uh, field of thinking, you know, the kind of radical activist field. And his successor, uh, after he, his, when No Hyun was a human rights lawyer, he had a partner, uh, a junior partner, uh, who also worked with him on human rights cases. The guy's name was Moon Jae-in. And uh, Moon Jae-in was the South Korean president just very recently. And Moon Jae-in became president was after No Hyun committed suicide in a very, very suspicious way, a very, very suspicious suicide. And uh, I'll just put it out there. I don't believe that it was a suicide. but after No Hyun died, Moon Jae-in decided that uh, I have to, you know, step back into the political arena. He was quite happy, you know, just to be in the wings, but he was forced back into the political arena and he organized the funeral and then decided that he had to take on the mantle of progressive politics. And then he uh, became uh, the president in 2016. So there's a long kind of history of tradition of resistance, of progressive struggle. And on the other hand, uh, you have a long, also an equally powerful counterforce of uh, fascism, colonialism, uh, quizzling subjugation to imperial design, first 
to Japanese colonization. They were the collaborators who worked with the Japanese uh, colonial uh, empire. And then these people became the same people who became the U.S. collaborators who essentially recreated Japanese colonization of the Southern Peninsula for the benefit of the United States. And so we have two trends, this kind of pro-Japanese, pro-U.S., pro-colonial, collaborator, quizzling class. And on the other hand, you have the patriots, the people who struggle for independence, the progressives who were opposed to imperialism, opposed to U.S. occupation, uh, and, uh, and striving uh, for reunification because North Korea represents that sovereign uh, determination, that sovereign resistance. The last thing I'll say about this is there are 28,500 U.S. troops on the Korean Peninsula, give or take. Uh, but actually, the 1953 armistice required that all foreign troops depart. And China, which had sent hundreds of thousands of troops, all of those troops are out. You will not find a single Chinese soldier on North Korean soil. But to this day, you, not only do you have 28,500 U.S. troops, but the U.S. still has, as I've said, operational control over South Korea's three and a half million uh, uh, active duty and reserve troops. Can you elaborate a little bit what that means, the operational control for uh, most, for people that might not know what that means uh, politically or on the ground? Yeah, operational control means that there is uh, the CFC, the Combined Forces Command and the United Nations Command and the United Forces Korea. Uh, and the person who heads these three forces uh, is a U.S. general who reports to the U.S. president. And the moment that the United States decides uh, or declares DEFCON 3, it means that this general uh, has control over all forces on the Korean Peninsula, including USFK troops, uh, the CNC, UNC troops, and all South Korean troops. They're his army, his materiel, his bases, uh, his capacity to do as he sees fit. Uh, essentially, the South Korean military simply becomes uh, the U.S. military. It's an appendage of the U.S. military. And this is something that was started in 1950 in July during the Korean War, and essentially it's never changed. There has been a slight change in the 1990s where the U.S. gave up complete operational control and decided that it was only going to have wartime operational control. But as I said, that's like saying that you know, you own the car when it's being driven and, and the other person owns the car when it's in the garage and they can change the oil and maintain it. But the only time that a car matters is when you're driving. And that's the same thing. The only time the military uh, is, under, is, is under real control is during wartime. And the U.S. gets to decide that any time. The reason why the U.S. transitioned from uh, total operational control to wartime operational control had to do with an incident in 1980, which is referred to as the Gwangju massacre. So Park chung hee the previous dictator, was assassinated by his own security chief. Massive protests arose because the South Koreans were glad to be rid of a dictator and they were hoping the country would open up and finally become a sane country, not under the boot hill, uh, under the boot heel of, uh, you know, of the military, a total garrison state under martial law. And uh, these protests uh, uh, took on a strong, uh, these protests erupted in a city in the South called Gwangju. And what the South Korean military did was they sent in paratroopers first to bludgeon, then to shoot, then to uh, massacre the protesters. And at the end of the day, you know, there were somewhere in the range of 3,000 uh, excess deaths that we assume were uh, killed by uh, the South Korean special forces and regular troops. They sent in something like 20,000 troops to, uh, to put down this, these uh, civilian protests. Uh, and uh, the, the sticky piece of all this 
is that when you have operational control over troops, you also have operational control over where they go and how they're deployed. And so there's no way the U.S. can avoid blame for this massacre of civilians by the South Korean military. That became extraordinarily inconvenient. And the U.S. complains, oh, we didn't know what was going on. You know, they were not under our opcon at the time. But what we do know, and this is being revealed in, you know, uh, documents that have been released, is that the U.S. released opcon to the South Korean military. And here's the thing is like, it's like you have a dangerous pit bull and you release your pit bull, you take it off the leash. That does not release you from responsibility, especially if you know that pit bull is in the presence of, you know, something that it's raring to go after. And the South Korea, you know, is a very small, uh, it's a very small peninsula and it's bristling with arms and bases. There's no way you could allow troops to go from one place to another without reporting exactly on what is happening, where, who's going where, what kind of, you know, material is being deployed, etc. So because of the embarrassment of the Kwangju massacre, the U.S. decided, oops, uh, you know, this uh, full-time operational control is embarrassing. Let's just say we have uh, wartime operational control. But ultimately it boils down to the fact that the U.S. has control over the South Korean military. It uses it as an appendage of U.S. geostrategic force during the Vietnam War. Do you know how many South Korean troops served in the Vietnam War? How many? I want to, I want to, I want to say it's in the millions, wasn't it? Uh, it wasn't quite in the millions. It was 320,000, oh. but it was still the second largest deployment after the U.S. military. And after 1972, uh, the numbers of South Korean troops were greater than the U.S. military itself. And so uh, the South Korean military has always been, uh, you know, the first to go, the last to know, you know, right after the U.S. military. They were right there in Afghanistan. Immediately, the U.S. sent in troops. South Koreans were there. Anywhere uh, the U.S. sends troops, the South Koreans are not far behind. So those are hidden facts that most Americans don't even know. Most of most. Most uh, military people don't even know because that's one of the things that they really caught me when I got there to uh, Korea. I ended, I was in Korea from uh, 2003 to 2005. And uh, um, one of the first things that, that when they picked me up from the airport and I got to uh, Yongsan, that's where the in-processing at. One of the first things that caught my eye was all those uh, uh, riot control guards right in front of the gate and they're there 24 seven, you know, they're there, you know, rain, snow, sleet, they're there, you know, and they just cover the whole, the whole entrance and whatnot. Um, and also another thing that caught me is soldiers that have been there and they're kind of blissful of what you're just saying right there. You just don't have a clue. I've been there for a year and they've, they've returned. Like my roommate was there and that was his fourth time. In Korea, because it's usually is a is a one year tour, and and he's been there. For, he had been there for time, and they're just so blissfully ignorant of what happens outside those gates and and what the Korean people uh, goes through. Another thing that the Kamai is that each each of those compounds, each of those bases, right, have this thing called a village, which is uh, uh, bars, restaurants, uh, shops and everything, all catered towards the military, right? Because the most, most soldiers, right? They don't drive. Most soldiers, most lower enlisted, they don't drive. So they have to walk everywhere or catch public transportation. So they just walk right off the base and that's where they have all their anemones for them, right? All the fun and everything. But a lot of, you know, uh, you see a lot of foreign people there. You see a lot of, you see they're owned by Korean owned, but you see a lot of Filipinos. You see a lot of, where I was there, you see a lot of Russians. Uh, also working in those bars, uh, but you do hardly you hardly saw Korean civilians around there. Korean public they seem to like like to stay away from those areas. Uh, what is can you can you explain to us a little bit what is that that relationship between uh, civil society and you know seeing and hosting this foreign and military and seeing them every day and, and how what is that what's that dynamic there? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. It's one of those things that nobody ever really wants to, you know, look, they don't want to look under the rug, but it's an um, exploitative situation. You're absolutely correct. Uh, you know, Yongsan, you know, you know, for a while there, it was one of the largest bases uh, in Asia, certainly in Korea. And right next to Yongsan, as soon as you go out, say, main post or south post and you go up the hill, you're in Hooker Hill and Itaewon, right? And then you're looking at endless bars and prostitution, etc. Why do we have this situation? It was actually created and designed by the military dictatorship of Park Jong-hee and even before then. And they're uh, literally a continuation of... Uh, the comfort women system. The Japanese military would recruit or actually press gang, kidnap young women into becoming sexual slaves for the Japanese military. After uh, the Japanese left, the South Korean dictatorship continued this system uh, because they had been Japanese collaborators in the Japanese military. And then in the 1960s, Park Jung hee was the dictator, military dictator at the time, decided that this is how we are going to build our country. This is how we're going to make money. And so they literally used young women uh, as a kind of, uh, 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 the, they created like this sex industry uh, that was a way of gaining foreign capital. And those areas around military bases, uh, they're a little bit like, uh, Free trade zones. They're free trade zones for for sex and entertainment. And it was largely understood that as a South Korean civilian, you were not supposed to be there. The only civilians you would see would be, uh, you know, uh, er early on, young, impoverished uh, women who, you know, uh, had no other means. Sometimes were tricked into the uh, into that uh, into the trade, and then later. Uh, uh, you saw Filipina and Russian and other uh, women from other, uh, you know, poorer countries that had been trafficked into that, uh, you know, sex trade. Uh, and, uh, and for South Korea, and we can see this as kind of a developmental process, South Korea, it really was a way of uh, creating capital, you know, just like you had sweatshops where the South Koreans sold their hair uh, and, you know, worked for pennies uh, to build their economy, uh, the, this camp town prostitution was considered to be an integral part of South Korea's economy. At one point, according to uh, economists, it was about 25% of the South Korean economy, or at least 25% of the foreign income earnings of South Korea, probably from 1960 until the 1970s. And the Korean uh, uh, government uh, recently said that somewhere between something like one out of three women uh, between the ages of 16 and 30 had been prostituted in their lives. So, you know, it's just uh, a horrific, uh, you know, kind of it's a horrific way to develop a country, and it speaks to the, uh, extraordinarily uh, exploitative and violent nature of uh, a military uh, economy, a military dictatorship, and when a country decides to become that kind of a quizzling state. Kind of reminds me of the, the um, I don't know what call it, segregation specifically, but the, the makeup of workers from uh, non-US and non-local places like in Iraq and Afghanistan that, you know, that there you would have large portions of Ugandans or guys from Senegal or, you know, uh, but, they're, but they, they weren't connected to the conflict. They weren't connected to the United States, but they had this, you know, the, this buffer area in there. And we knew that, you know, I know, you know, they're at a pennies com certainly comparatively in terms of the workers, but, but, you know, I always had those questions is why, why don't, you know, why didn't we have more Iraqis doing more of, of those kind of things? And it was, we didn't want to see them. We didn't, you know, that, that those, 
people that the way that they were contracted, they literally provided that, that extra buffer that Americans are need to have to maintain their, their ignorance bubble. Um, but, and then of course, you know, that the, you know, all of the, talking about all of the, the different advancements, moving the base and, and expanding the size much bigger that essentially we just take that, that format wherever we go. And it sounds like that over a long period of time that it was refined and, and really dialed down to become what it, what it is today. I had wanted to ask about the, you know, they, they, we had the, uh, reading about the recent protests there and the, the American mainstream media keeping a long, long, long distance from it, that how does, how do people in South Korea, you know, their, their level of their under or their understanding of militarism, not so much about the American involvement there or even Korea's own military, but just, just in general, that, that is it, is it something that's, that people do discuss or is it, is it something that is not, it's not so much of a, or of a concern or that it becomes so toxic because it, if, you know, like in the U S if you talk against the military, then you're unpatriotic. You don't care about your countrymen. You're not, you know, that there's, there's all these different layers to it. I'm, I'm curious about how the Korean people deal with, with kind of that, that dichotomy. That's another really good question. Um, one of the things I will say is uh, militarism has so deeply soaked into the fiber of Korean society that it's considered uh, simply part of life of a life passage. You know, there's this South Korean uh, K-pop group called BTS, uh, and they're you know kind of supposed to be superstars. Right now, they all have to go into the military. You know, every single one of them has to do their military service. And, you know, they're not going to be, you know, doing the Elvis thing. You know, they're going to be in the mud, you know, crawling. And uh, and in the meantime, you know, the K-pop fans will be, you know, cooling their heels. So uh, there's a there's an expectation that um, that the military is something that everybody has to go through. It is such a deeply embedded part of South Korean culture. South Korean, I would say Korean culture is not inherently militaristic, but in the post-Japanese colonial era, it turned into this extraordinarily Spartan militaristic society. And so, uh, for example, uh, you know, South Korea has one of the, it has the largest standing military force in the world, if you include reservists talking about 3.5 million. Uh, it's uh, for the longest period, it was a garrison state uh, up until at least the 1990s. Uh, it had, until very recently, there was no way to be a conscientious objector. And so it had the largest number of people who had been imprisoned. I think 99% of people imprisoned for resisting military service uh, were South Koreans, uh, and uh, somewhere in the range of you know uh, tens of thousands had been uh, uh, imprisoned. And once again, you know, because the Korean War has never ended, uh, simply going AWOL was actually considered uh, desertion. And so, you know, under certain uh, circumstances, uh, you could be shot, uh, you know, simply for leaving your post. There's an interesting uh, set of an interesting TV series on Netflix called Deserter Patrol, DP Patrol. And it talks about these South Korean uh, troops uh, whose job is to uh, go back and capture deserters. And I think it gives you a good sense of what the South Korean military is like. But it has so deeply pervaded uh, the Korean psyche and the South Korean culture that I think people don't understand how pernicious and uh, dangerous it is. I mean, what that translates to on the ground is uh, a kind of hyper masculinity, a hyper macho, uh, you know, uh, the kind of authoritarianism, the uh, this inability to relate uh, in genuine, authentic terms. 
uh, as well as you know the typical things like domestic violence, uh, uh, brutality. There's a Korean you know comedy called Attack the Gas Station. It's a bunch of youth who decide they're going to rob a gas station, uh, and it you know is a little bit of a cult following. But if you watch, they uh, try to rob a gas station. The gas station doesn't have money, so they decide they're going to run the gas station for about ten hours and take all the money from the customers. And in the meantime, they take all of the employees of the gas station and they torture them. And if you watch the torture carefully, you realize that what they're doing to these uh, gas station employees is they're making them do military drills. These are military, uh, you know, it's, essentially it's military torture, but it's so kind of normalized. People see that and they think, oh, isn't that funny? How Quentin Tarantino? No. Any Korean who sees that says, oh shit, they're doing exactly you know, what I did or what they did uh, in the military. So you mentioned that movie. I uh, noticed that recently there is a popularity here in the United States with the Korean, Korean made movies. Um, uh, one of them, I think, uh, um, The Parasite uh, was one of them that, uh, that I saw. And I found it very interesting because of the class differences that was there. Because when I got to Korea, for example, my, my uncle was in Korea before, before me. He was in Korea in the, in the 90s, in the early 90s. And he was telling me the way he explained Korea to me, like it was uh, um, like very impoverished and, and so and so, right? Um, and like I said, my roommate had been in Korea four times. And he was telling me this last time when he was there, when I was there, he saw it was like night and day from the other times that he was in Korea. Like, you know, how rapidly economically Korea so developed. When I got there, I saw Korea like this big, you know, bustling, you know, high, you know, city, Seoul, you know, high standard living, you know, very, you know, uh, highways, nice cars, you know, very advanced, very advanced, right? And which had, which is, which is some parallels to where I'm from, Ocho, and I saw parallels there. I'm, you know, I'm originally from Puerto Rico and I saw how, and Puerto Rico had a lot of money, a lot of money was put in Puerto Rico in the 60s and 70s to kind of counter the, 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 the Cuban influence in, in Latin America, which, which I, I saw the same way as to counter, you know, North Korea, you know, uh, you know, you put so much money in South Korea to make it more attractive and so forth, right? So going back to the movie of, of Parasite, you know, that movie showed a lot of inequality within that, the facade of a prosperous South Korea. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, no, these are such great questions. Um, yeah, you're absolutely correct. I mean, the class contradictions and the class exploitation are the fundamental thing you need to understand about South Korea's development. It was built on the backs of the blood and the suffering of the vast majority of the working class. And uh, if, you, if you look at some of the chronicles of the conditions of the sweatshops uh, during the 1970s, even up to the 1980s, you know, people will say these were circles circles of hell to make Engels and Dante faint. You know, they would have children eight years old working 24-hour shifts, sometimes for days at a time. And if they couldn't keep working, they would, uh, they would shoot them up with methamphetamine to keep them working. Remember, methamphetamine was invented by the Japanese military to keep their industrial force going and their military you know, going. And so hiropon or methamphetamine uh, was used to keep the workers going. People would die from overwork. We have this term kwarosa, which means death from overwork. Uh, and uh, the entire country was run like a labor concentration camp. As I said, until the 1960s, <laughs> um, you know, South Korea was one of the poorest, it was probably the second poorest country on the planet uh, after the war. Uh, and then up until the 1960s and until 1978, it was poorer than North Korea. North Korea was richer, more, uh, you know, more industrialized, more economically advanced, et cetera, although you would never know that. 
and South Korea uh, built its wealth from sweatshop labor. And when I say sweatshop labor, really the kind of, you know, the kind of unimaginable, unimaginable, you know, kind of Dickensian, you know, unspeakable human exploitation, along with sexual exploitation, which I said, you know, was about 25% of the economy. And then the third piece, the third leg of that economy uh, was military exploitation. That is to say, from 1965 until 1974, 1975, uh, you had 320,000 Korean troops uh, work for the U.S. military, and they would send their money back to South Korea. So these were the huge three big stools that allowed, uh, three legs of the stool that allowed South Korea to have this capital accumulation in order to industrialize. And along with that, South Korea was given lots and lots of aid from the United States. Up until the 60s, it received as a single country more a foreign aid than the entire continent of Africa. And then it was given this kind of very protectionist bubble. It was raised in this little hothouse because the U.S. wanted to turn it into a capitalist show pony, that they had to show that this was a system that could beat the communists in the North. Well, the communists were beating them hands down, at least until 1978. Uh, and uh, South Korea was struggling. It was this, you know, horrific, exploitative uh, nightmare uh, of of worker exploitation. But slowly they crawled th themselves out because, you know, they were given because they were supposed to be this kind of teacher's pet of Western capitalism. And then, uh, starting the eighties, the economy started to turn around. They exported labor into Iran and Iraq. They were doing a lot of the construction during the Iran and Iraq war. And I, I had a colleague who was working during the Iran Iraq war. He said that they were building derricks and, you know, oil construction platforms. They would be forced to work, uh, you know, while the bombs were coming down. So that's again, another example of how brutal this labor regime was. It really was a kind of state uh, capitalism that was modeled after the Japanese model in Manchuria. In Manchuria, there was this kind of a developmental state that the uh, Nobusuku Kishi built in Manchuria that was essentially built on slave labor. Uh, and South Korea borrowed uh, that uh, model and used it to build up its economy. And then starting the 80s and 90s, it became more affluent. And then 1997, the United States decided that, okay, this show pony has served its purpose and we don't have to raise it in the hothouse anymore. And so then they pulled the plug on it and they forced uh, IMF structural reforms and the fattened cow was pulled over the table and slaughtered. And, uh, and that, again, was a huge uh, kind of economic devastation to South Korea at the time. You mentioned, uh, uh, you mentioned North Korea uh, or the, the, yeah, North Korea being uh, uh, more prosperous and more industrious in South Korea until, until recently, right? Until the, uh, 1978, it was richer. So then you have 1991, you have the, the dissolution of, of the Soviet Union breaks up into like 15 countries. Uh, they start having these, uh, these color revolutions in Eastern Europe, you know, where the, where one by one, each socialist government is overthrown by a, a neoliberal government, you know, uh, the last uh, so prosperous or the last, you know, industrial prosperous socialist country in Europe, uh, was overthrown by war, which is Yugoslavia and was broken into six more countries. Um, then you have, uh, Cuba started having its special period because no longer Cuba had socialist trading partners, um, and Russia and the other former socialist countries, you know, Czechoslovakia and all that. And they just pretty much, you know, went the Western way and they just pulled the plug out of Cuba and they just stopped 
trading with Cuba. Um, no, Korea started plunging that, in that, in that in plunging as well in 1990 because of this geographic, geopolitical uh, shift that was happening at the time. Enter comes Clinton, Bill Clinton comes in and he tries and he has some type of rapprochement or he try he has some type of a relationship with, with North Korea. Uh, can you tell us how that goes, how that, how that went? Yes. Um, so once again, really, really great questions. The first thing I'll say is that, um, and just to kind of, you know, pull back and look at the large historical perspective. South Korea was colonized from 1905 until 1910 until 1945 by the Japanese. As colonizations go, you know, it's, you know, it's probably as bad as they get. Um, they enslaved millions of Koreans, uh, sent them to war, sent them to mines, sent them to Manchuria. Uh, there's a, we historians sometimes talk of the term, the Manchurian passage, similar to the a middle passage where millions of Koreans and Chinese were taken to Manchuria and worked to death in the Japanese industrial uh, uh, project to militarize, to create an industrial base for its war across the Pacific. But after 1945, South Korea was liberated. When it was liberated, the Korean population, which had been resisting the Japanese occupation, had thousands of workers committees. And these workers committees came together, worked together, and they decided that they were going to create a socialist state in South Korea. This was called the Korean People's Republic. And it was declared in the fall of 1945. So Korea was de facto independent and it was de facto socialist. And it was a kind of indigenous socialism created by the patriots and the independence fighters, the resistance fighters against Japanese colonization. Two American soldiers, you know, cut the Korean peninsula into half, decided the U.S. was going to occupy the southern half. Russia was going to occupy the northern half. This became the 38th parallel. In the north, they continued this indigenous socialism. In the south, the U.S. military government decided that it was going to, that no way could they allow uh, socialism uh, to happen on the Korean Peninsula, that it would have a head start over any other place in the world. So they decided they were going to wipe out the Korean People's Republic. They made it illegal. They arrested all of its leaders. They banned the Korean workers' committees. They banned all the unions. Pretty soon, the South Koreans started to protest. You started to see protests in the thousands, the tens of thousands, the hundreds of thousands. And these were all brutally repressed through mass shootings. So you started to see the beginnings of uh, what is essentially a genocide, not unlike what we saw in uh, Indonesia, uh, the Jakarta method. So essentially, it's a policy of politicide, a genocide, killing off all the progressives and the socialists in order to establish a capitalist client state. Um, just prior to the breakout of the Korean War, uh, the government declared an amnesty and it said to everybody who was in the South, anybody who is, uh, you know, has progressive or pro-North or pro-communist tendencies, just come in, admit that you are, we'll put you through some re-education uh, and then we'll, and then we'll let you go and we'll give you a general amnesty. And so they press ganged 300,000 people into signing up for what was called these uh, education and guidance leagues, the Bodo Yan Meng. And then when the war broke out, every single one of these uh, people was rounded up and shot to death in mass graves. So we think somewhere in the range of 300,000, perhaps more, uh, going into the millions were shot to death by the South Korean Quisling military government. So uh, why is this important? Because, you know, once again, if we think of this kind of North, South, socialist, capitalist divide, you can see that that 
uh, those tectonics, uh, those plates that clash was set up in probably the most violent and, and brutal way uh, on the Korean Peninsula. And we still have the reverberations of that, you know, of those plates colliding up until the current moment, echoing through Vietnam, through Indonesia, and then all the way up to the collapse of the Soviet Union. Specifically relating to the collapse of the Soviet Union, as I said before, North Korea is 85% mountains. It has only 15% uh, of its land is arable. You can only grow crops on 15% of that land. And that land has to be fertilized with fossil fertilizer, petrochemical fertilizers. Without the use of petrochemical fertilizers, you cannot grow enough food. There's simply the land is too barren. And so when the Soviet Union collapsed, North Korea, which has a border with the Soviet Union, it stopped receiving fertilizer and it stopped receiving uh, oil, which was, what, which was what was necessary to power its uh, industry and to grow its food. And as a result of that, North Korea started to go into a deep economic spiral and collapse. And under most circumstances, most countries would have simply given up. They would have simply collapsed. North Koreans didn't. Uh, what they started to do was they said, since we don't have uh, fossil fuels, we are going to build a nuclear reactor and use that to cover some of our energy needs. When North Korea started to do that, the U.S. started to panic and they said, oh, you know, they're building the bomb. And so Bill Clinton started negotiations with North Korea in what is now referred to as the agreed framework. And the idea was that uh, the United States would build North Korea a light water reactor where the fissile materials couldn't be turned into a weapons grade material. Uh, they would build two of them. And in the meantime, they would supply North Korea with fuel oil uh, until some such time as the uh, nuclear re reactors came online. After signing this agreement with the North Korean government, within weeks, the agreement was dead on arrival. The U.S. Congress, the Republicans, refused to endorse it. And so the U.S. essentially did not give North Korea its reactors. It spent, I think, it waited eight years before it even broke ground on the first reactor. And the delivery of fuel oil was almost non-existent. It was spotty non-existent. And after waiting, uh, you know, for almost a decade, North Korea said, we give up. You know, clearly you guys are not playing. You guys are just, you know, fooling with us. And that was actually admitted later. The idea was that, uh, you know, the Clinton administration's approach, what they call, uh, which is now referred to as strategic patience, it was a collapsist doctrine. The idea is that if we starve North Korea at the same time that we throw out this little, you know, uh, throw some breadcrumbs at them, eventually they will collapse. Well, the North Koreans didn't collapse. I mean, they went through what they call the arduous march, horrific times, if you can imagine. I mean, Cuba you know, has rich soil and it's, you know, in the Caribbean, you know, so it has a capacity to at least do its own, a certain level of self-sufficiency with organic farming. North Korea didn't have that. It's barren mountainous soil in a cold climate. And so the West was expecting North Korea to collapse, uh, but the North Koreans didn't fall. They didn't collapse. They decided they were simply going to continue the way, started their own process of building uh, weapons and and tighten their belts until they couldn't tighten anymore. And now they're still here, uh, kicking and screaming, but still around. North Korea is the longest existing socialist state on the planet. It has outlasted the Soviet Union. It has outlasted China. It's still around. Uh, and under normal circumstances, if it hadn't been if it hadn't been threatened with existential annihilation and forced to struggle for every inch or for every breath, I think that it would actually be a, a rich and prosperous country. Certainly, that was the case until 1978. You know, the 
British economist, Joan Robinson, talked about the Korean miracle. And she was talking about North Korea, not South Korea. So I think it would have been very prosperous and wealthy. And without the interference of the United States, I think North and South Korea would have been unified a long time ago. And they would become, you know, their own prosperous, uh, you know, uh, confederation. But up until the present moment, starting with the moment that the U.S. took a National Geographic map and drew a line across the 38th parallel, until the current moment, the U.S. has been the greatest obstacle to peace and reunification on the Korean Peninsula. And the United States needs North Korea, and it needs that escalation, escalated tension, not simply for Cold War reasons, but North Korea is being used as a stalking horse for the containment and the escalation of war against China. Absolutely. And what you said there is, like you said, parallels with, the, uh, with what happened with Cuba, with the Helms and Burn Act, uh, where after the the dissolution of the Soviet Union, uh, the Soviet Union, then, you know, the Russians on the Yel- on the first Gorbachev on the Yeltsin, then there's a, this approach to the United States pretty much subordinated themselves to the West uh, and broke ties with Cuba. Then Cuba at the same time, the Clinton administration, right, pushed for the, I would call the, the Helms and Act, the Helms and Burn Act, uh, which was uh, uh, making sanctions against Cuba kind of permanent, is legal now. You know, you have to. It takes an act of Congress to to abolish the 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 sanction. You know, and the idea was the same. The idea was to 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 strengthen strengthen the screws on sanctions on Cuba. So you know, given that Cuba does you know doesn't have the the socialist bloc anymore to 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 trade with, and just see it's it's collapsed and. Like North Korea, it haven't it hasn't happened on um, Cuba either. Um, I want to move to something else. Uh, uh, with I was watching a video by I've seen the podcast uh, Left Lens with uh, uh, with uh, Danny Haifal. Uh, yes, and he was yes, in, yes. he was interviewing uh, this young woman named Janice Jin, and she is from the. Uh, uh, the Asylum Seeker Advocacy Project. And she mentioned, they were talking about uh, this, this popular North Korean woman here in the West, the United States, named uh, uh, Yomi Park. And she gets a lot of interviews and a lot of, uh, you know, you know, a lot of interviews and how horrible conditions are in North Korea. You know, people have to push trains and, and all kinds of stuff, right? But she said something, uh, uh, Jana said something that really caught my eye is that she talked about the 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 asylum seeking industry or you know complex you know the asylum industry complex. I think, I think that's the way she she worded it. Yeah. So this is really important. Um, South Korea considers everybody on the Korean Peninsula to be quote unquote their citizen. So if somebody from North Korea comes to South Korea. Uh, they are considered to be a South Korean citizen. Uh, and then they're given benefits and they're integrated into society, etc. That's the idea. And originally the idea was really a kind of propaganda project, right? So from time to time, somebody from North Korea would defect to South Korea and then they would trot them out. And in, in exchange for denouncing North Korea, and spinning stories of about how horrendous it was, then they would be given benefits and all kinds of privileges. And then during the arduous march, uh, a lot of North Koreans did leave North Korea. And North Korea has very porous borders with China. Uh, essentially, you just walk, uh, you know, you either cross the river or you just walk across the border. And so a lot of Chinese would go into, a lot of Koreans would go into China. Some of them eventually found their way into South Korea. And the key thing to understand is that the majority of them were economic refugees. They were not political refugees. They were not particularly seeking asylum. Uh, They were like people coming from any impoverished country to a richer country, you know, as 
as you know, as is the case with many, many borders. The North Korea was going through this extraordinary difficult period. Uh, many North Koreans left the country and they were trying to send remittances back to North Korea. And some of them ended up in South Korea. And then eventually this turned into an industry and it's an industry of lies and confabulation telling stories about North Korea. So the more extraordinary and the more far-fetched and the more exaggerated uh, your story is, the more money and the more fame and the more uh, rewards you receive. And if you really kind of reach the top tier, like Pak Yumi, or there was another guy who wrote this book about Escape from Camp 14, then you even hit the American speech, you know, the lecture circuit. And you get a TED talk and you get to talk about how awful it is in North Korea. And so there's all these incentives for people to make up stories. And, uh, you know, Pagyon Mi is probably one of the worst because every single thing that comes out of her mouth is a lie. Even her mother has said that my daughter doesn't know what she's talking about. She said that on South Korean television. You know, she said that, you know, I was raped. My mother was raped. You know, you know, we saw people in the streets dying. Uh, we pushing trains. Just things that are so absurd that anybody, you know, with two neurons, you know, would think that, you know, that's not right. But Pagyan Mi is going around, you know, telling these lies. This guy uh, who wrote the book Escape from Camp 14. It all turned out to be lies about this labor camp. Uh, he, he, he's now gone silent and his American co-author has gone dead silent because everything that he's said or a large part of it has turned out to be lies and there's no way of confirming any of the rest of it. But it is part of an ongoing... Um, you have to understand the Korean War has never ended. Uh, both legally and in a kind of de facto sense. The war is not over. And because of that, as we said earlier in the show, there is a constant battle for the moral high ground. There is a constant ethic. There is a constant information war. And because South Korea has always been such a poor performer in terms of human rights and social justice, what it has done instead is always tried to create this incredibly demonizing portrait of North Korea and this uh, in asylum industrial complex is one of the key ways that it maintains this. Now, from time to time, you will have people who break with that. If you look at the surveys, uh, you know, something like the majority of North Korean uh, asylees in South Korea say they want to get out of there. They say their lives are miserable. A good chunk of them say they want to go back to North Korea. Some of them have asked to be repatriated and they've been denied. Sometimes you get South Koreans who try and escape to North Korea uh, and you don't hear about that, but usually they're shot to death on the border by South Korean troops. So, you know, uh, a few years back, there was, there was some people having medical issues. They wanted to go to North Korea to get medical treatment. They were shot dead on the border. Recent South Korean fisheries official, we think that he may have been trying to defect to North Korea. It's unclear. And so there's an entire industry of deception where up is down and uh, black is white. And, uh, and it's part of this ongoing information warfare, which simply attests to the fact that North Korea and South Korea are still at war because they are still a proxy uh, war. South Korea is, is a proxy warrior for U.S. geopolitical interests. One last thing, um, KG. Um, so, so given this, you know, we're talking about Korea, well, in the, in the geopolitical sense, right now we're seeing Huge rifts, huge changes in the uh, in the geopolitics. You know, we're seeing with this war in Ukraine, uh, which is a, a proxy war, NATO proxy war against Russia. Uh, there's a lot of shifts going on. Um, things things are kind of shaky, tectonic plates moving. How do you see 
situation in Korea going on, uh, you know, that Korea has been a united peninsula, united society for, for so much longer than it has been separated. Do you see anything in the future of this coming to a close, this chapter coming to a close and, and how this shift, this Teutonic shift going on around the world, how is, how this affects, how would this affect the, uh, politics in South Korea and, and the Korean Peninsula? Um, in the short term, uh, it's going to be very, very risky. It's going to be very, very dangerous. As you point out, the world is shifting from uh, unipolarity, that is to say U.S. hegemony, to multipolarity. And those shifts are happening on the Asian continent uh, because traditionally the global imperial colonial powers controlled the seas. They were naval powers. And in the 20th and 21st century, the power is shifting to land-based powers, and in particular to the powers that are centered in the Eurasian continent. I'm talking about Russia and uh, China. And so the center of gravity is moving from the Atlantic West to the global South as centered in uh, Eurasia. U.S. has been aware of this. Starting from the fall of the Soviet Union in uh, starting 1991 onwards, the U.S. had a plan to have to maintain control of the planet. And they wrote this up in the 1991 Defense Plan and Guidance Document, which became the project for a new American century. And this project for a new American century was, you know, we are the globe's uh, sole power. We uh, give ourselves the right to exercise our unipolar power wherever and whenever we see fit. We want full spectrum dominance of the planet, and we give ourselves the right to wage preemptive war against any country. And more than anything else, we have to prevent the rise of a regional power that would challenge our supremacy. That was written into doctrine, and it came down through Paul Wolfowitz into the project for the new American century, became the Bush Doctrine, which became the Obama Doctrine. In the Obama Doctrine became the pivot to Asia, which was an explicit plan to contain and roll back China. And this became the Trump Doctrine, and it is now the Biden Doctrine. So there is this plan to encircle, contain, roll back, take down China, prevent it from developing, prevent it from challenging the United States superiority, uh, economic superiority, and essentially to put it back into its place as a part of the global uh, capitalist structure as an extractive uh, subordinate inside that structure. When the US says that China is a threat, that's what they mean. They're saying it's a threat the way that Cuba is a threat, the way that Haiti is a threat, it's a threat because it will not stay in its subordinate position. And that is a threat to our notion or our worldview, our, the way that we want hegemony. It's as if you have uh, a parasite uh, uh, and a host. And when the host tries to detach the parasite from its skin, the parasite will see that as an existential threat. The global West is parasitic on the global South. Uh, the capitalist, at the capitalist apex, it has sucked out, according to certain estimates from 1960, what, $150 trillion, uh, you know, from the global South. Anytime you look at the uh, economic exchanges, you see that there's this constant extraction of wealth, of resources, of energy from the global south, including human energy, uh, fossil energy, et cetera, et cetera. Only a half dozen countries have broken out of this colonial extractive relationship to become developed after 1945. Uh, they are South Korea and uh, Taiwan, but they don't really count because they're capitalist show ponies raised in a hot house. You have Singapore which is sui generis, a city-state. Uh, you have a few uh, tax havens, and then you have a few petro-states. Those are the only countries that have shifted from absolute colonial poverty into a de developed world status 
in the global south. The one exception that, to that is China. China has developed on its own terms. And originally, the U.S. engagement with China was actually a regime change plan. They believed that if they engaged with China and made it liberalized, eventually they could do what they did to the Soviet Union, essentially dismember it, turn it into a capitalist uh, neoliberal state that they could plug and utilize and exploit at will. The Chinese didn't let that happen. And they pushed back, they prevented that, and therefore now they're being labeled as author authoritarian. Authoritarian is simply a code, code word for not submitting to U.S. hegemony. And because they've developed on their own terms, they've become a center of gravity for the rest of the global South to develop as well. And they've created the Belt and Road building relations with all the other countries, the Shanghai Cooperative Organization, uh, RCEP, et cetera. All of these kind of global uh, international structures, multilateral structures are being built by China in the Eurasian continent and all around. And this is continuing all the way into Africa and even Europe. And the U.S. sees itself existentially threatened by the rise of an alternate pole of power, which says to the world, you don't have to be capitalist. You can be socialist or you can be market socialist or you can develop on your own terms. You don't have to be sub, a subaltern, subordinate partner to the imperial machine and its extractive exploitation. And you can have peace and you can relate to other countries as equals. And this is what the Chinese model is showing. And the ruling class uh, in the imperial north in the United States they would rather see the end of the planet than the end of their privilege, which is why we see this acceleration to war everywhere, both on the Western Front with Russia and on the Eastern Front all around China. South Korea is very important in this because there are several vulnerabilities. It's like a face, the nose, the bridge of the nose is South Korea. The chin is Taiwan. The jaw is Hong Kong. The back of the head, the occiput, is uh, Xinjiang and Tibet. And uh, the choke point or the throat is the South China Sea. So the U.S. has war gamed out all these different vulnerabilities. If you think of China as a face or a body, these are the vulnerabilities around the Chinese uh, continent. And they're escalating to war. And South Korea is a really, really, really important part of this escalation because as we've said before, the U.S. has OPCON, over 3.5 million troops. It has a massive military capacity and also uh, simply geostrategically in terms of position. It's one of the nodes along this first island chain of encirclement going from the Philippines to Taiwan Island to Okinawa to Jeju Island to the Korean Peninsula and to Japan. This is how this encirclement and rollback is set up. So in the short term, it's very, very dangerous. North Korea could be a trigger point. But uh, over the long term, the Chinese approach is simply, let's keep our balance. Let's not react. Let's continue to work for win-win, mutual development, mutual cooperation, uh, and mutual security. And I think over the long run, if, uh, if the U.S. does not provoke China into war, over the long run, I think the other countries will see the value uh, of uh, creating and going along with this multilateral, multipolar world. And if that happens, then we have a chance. If it doesn't happen, I think we're looking at world war and potentially nuclear war. And I think what we can do in the Imperial North, in the United States, in the belly of the beast, is to give the chance for other countries in the global South to develop their own way and to stop our own military and our own, the US government from trying to press gang, escalate, create war, provoke war, and subjugate and, and, and do color revolutions and constantly interfere uh, and, and uh, abuse the global South. If we back off, and give 
the rest of the world a chance. I think we have a possibility for peace and development and, you know, even sustainable development. Well, I, uh, I think that's a good place for us to, uh, to wrap it up for the, for this evening. Um, KJ, thank you so much for coming and sharing your time with us. It's been invaluable. I've learned so many different things that I didn't know, uh, previously. Um, will you, uh, share with the listeners where they can find and uh, read your work? Um, they can go to counterpunch monthly review online, Asia times, uh, uh dissident voice, counterpunch, uh, LA progressive. I write in, you know, black agenda report. I write for a lot of progressive magazines websites. Uh, they can also see some of my work on Pivot to Peace, which is a website d dedicated to improving relations between the U.S. and China and telling the truth about, uh, you know, uh, this escalation to war. Uh, and then I'm also, uh, quite often I'm on the shows such as Critical Hour uh, and Any Means Necessary uh, on the on podcasts and on the Sputnik uh, a network. Hey, Jay, it's, been, it's been great talking to you. I mean, I can conversate with you like for, for hours, for many more hours. Like I said, this, we, we exchange emails, you know, or we, we're part of the same uh, Korea peace, peace initiative. And so I, I get to read, you know, read, read what, you know, everybody's trafficking, but it's the first time I actually sit down and have a conversation with you. And like I said, you know, it's been, been great. And uh, you did uh, tear up a lot of uh, questions I had while my experience in Korea, you know, that, you know, that will, that you, you know, pretty much explained it to me. Uh, but yeah, great. I mean, it's been a, it's been a great honor to be here with you. And, uh, and I'm sure that, you know, your listeners, our listeners, you know, will we'll, we'll come out, you know, with a better perspective of, of what's going on outside the American borders, you know, and, and geopolitical and, and, and see that we are part of a larger world, you know, and there are a lot of things moving and here, like you say, we're in the building of beast here, we're where we're supposed to be. And here is where we can make the change that, you know, to get this, you know, to navigate this, 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 uh, terrain that we're in right now. Absolutely. Yes. And it's a real pleasure to be with you. I uh, really appreciated your questions, the dialogue, the richness of our co, uh, uh, co thinking around these issues. And once again, I just want to say it's so important for us right now, critical moment. We all have to work for peace. Uh, we have to prevent our, uh, empire from, uh, escalating. And I think the best thing for us right now is to try and uh, prevent uh, this escalation. So let's all work for peace and despair is not an option. No, absolutely. absolutely. Great, great closing words. Um, so thank you again, KJ. I hope that you will uh, come on the podcast again. You sound like someone that would be a, a great person for our episode zero series, like you and I talked about before we started. And uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today, listening or watching, however you are. And we hope you take care. See you next time. Money is tight these days for everyone. Penny pinching to make it through the month often doesn't give people the funds to contribute to a creator they support. So we consider it the highest honor that folks help us fund the podcast in any dollar amount they're able. Patreons is the main place to do that, and for supporters who can donate $10 a month or more, they will be listed right here as an honorary producer, like these fine folks. Fahim Shirazi, James Obar, James Higgins, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Janet Hansen, Daniel Fleming, Michael Karen, Ren Jacob, Howard Reynolds, Rick Coffey, Scott Spaulding, Spooky Tooth, and the Status Quo Podcast. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. 
or please check out our store on Spreadshirt for some great Fortress merch. We're on Twitter and on Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time. I will know.